Thanks very much to the organizers for uh, this lovely conference and um, really enjoyed it so far. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about finite quotients and coarse geometry. So um, tell me if my writing gets too small at the back. Um, and I'd like to start off with just um, by just introducing uh, an object which is probably of interest to all of us here since uh, we're interested in Banach spaces and Hilbert spaces here. So I'd just like to start off with a definition which probably most of you have seen. Um, but it's an interesting object which has uh, interesting properties with respect to embeddability in these uh, spaces which we all care about. So. Um, so um, we're going to be looking at sequences of finite graphs mainly in this talk. So um, I'm going to look at a sequence xn of finite graphs. Um, and this sequence is called an expander. If, um, so first of all, we want this sequence to be getting bigger and bigger, so we want um, the limit of the number of vertices of each graph um, to tend to infinity as we go further along in our sequence. Uh, we want our graphs to be um, not, too, um, not too complicated, so we want the, the valency of the graphs to be bounded, so the degree. Uh, we want some uniform bound, let's say d. Uh, such that the degree of every vertex is bounded by this um, uniform degree. Okay, um, usually we'll look at uh, regular graphs, so where the degree is always the same, always equal to d. And then finally, um, we want our graphs to be well connected in order for them to have these strange properties with respect to embeddings and various spaces, okay? So what we want here is uh, we need to measure of how well connected the graphs are, right? So, and the measure we're going to take is uh, the Chiga constant. Um, so the Chiga constant, which is denoted by H, we want the Chiga constant of every graph to be bounded from below by epsilon, okay? Um, so what's the Chiga constant? I'll just remind you, probably you've seen this constant before. Um, this constant essentially measures how difficult it is to disconnect our graph. So what we do is we take some finite subset of our, of our graph. So I want to introduce this h of x for a finite graph x. Um, we take some finite subset of our graph and we um, look at how connected is this finite subset to the rest of the graph, okay? So this is the boundary of A. This is all the edges that I would have to cut through in order to remove A from uh, the rest of the graph, okay? And then I divide through by the uh, minimum over the size of A and the size of uh, A complement. So look at this quantity, okay? Just to restrict myself to subsets which are at most size a half in my, in my graph. Okay, and then I take the uh, infimum over all such subsets. So uh, if this constant is large, you can see that it's difficult to disconnect any subset from the rest of my graph. Okay, so that's an expander. And um, well, why do we care about these things? So um, as I said, they have strange embeddability properties. And uh, for that, I'll just remind you what a coarse embedding is. So I think we've seen it already in uh, Thomas Schlumpschacht's uh, talk, but I'll just to remind you the definition again. So if we have two metric spaces, x and y, a map between them, is a coarse embedding. If uh, there exists some control functions 
rho plus and rho minus, which uh, bound how the distance uh, is distorted in the in the image. Okay, so uh, we want these functions to behave uh, in the following way. So we want them to tend to infinity. We want them to be maybe strictly increasing, and um, so we want the, the distance in the image to be bounded either side by uh, these control functions of the original distance. Okay, so okay, so. Particularly if these functions are linear, that's what we call a quasi-isometry. Um, but in general, we don't care. We just want um, this kind of behavior. So this just means that um, if you have some sequence of pairs of points, such the distance between these points tends to infinity in x, you also want in the image the distance between these points to tend to infinity. Okay? So, um, so it's a kind of coarse notion of inclusion of one space into the other, as opposed to a uniform embedding, which is uh, which cares more about the small scale, this cares more about the large scale, okay? And, um, and we say this is a coarse equivalence. This is going to be important later. If in addition, there exists some constant uh, such that um, the image forms uh, a C net in uh, in the, the space Y, okay? So there exists some C such that um, for all Y and Y, uh, the distance between Y and the image of X is bounded by C, okay? So it's a C net. Okay, so um, that's the kind of maps that we're gonna care about in this talk, and uh, as I, said expanders don't behave uh, very well. Well, they behave in an interesting way with respect to Banach spaces in particular. So uh, expanders are some of the most important objects which do not coarsely embed. I'll write it like this. Okay, coarse embeddings. Expanders do not coarsely embed into Hilbert space. Um, they don't embed into LP spaces for any P. Uh, smaller than infinity. Okay, so um, they have this interesting behavior. And actually, it's an interesting question uh, to what extent this can be extended. So um, an interesting open question is, uh, can expanders embed coarsely into... Uh, any uniformly convex Banach space. Okay, and expanders which do not embed into any uniformly convex Banach space uh, are called super expanders, okay? So. Okay, so if this is not possible then and this is called a super expander. Okay. Um, great. So we have these interesting objects. And uh, of course, we'd like some examples of them. And uh, so, first of all, it wasn't even clear to begin with that these objects existed because, well, these are seemingly contradictory properties because uh, this is some saying that your graph is very well connected, and this is saying that you don't have that many edges to play with. Okay. So, this is not even clear that these exist. Um, and there was a, initially a probabilistic proof of their existence by Pinska. Uh, and the first construction was by Margulis in the 70s. And uh, this is where groups come into play. So uh, it turns out that you can actually use group theory very effectively to construct some of these interesting objects. Um, and what Margulis did was he took uh, 
finite quotients. of a group with property T, something like SL3Z. Okay, property T just means that uh, you cannot act in a nice way on a Hilbert space. Uh, and these finite quotients of any property T group actually give you expanders. Okay, so if you take some sequence of quotients which um, has cardinalities tending to infinity, then this will be an expander. And um, I just want to uh, tell you a bit more about this kind of construction. Uh, well, so, so there are other constructions. There are um, also some combinatorial constructions and some constructions which uh, mirror this kind of construction a little bit. So uh, zigzag products are another way to construct expanders. Um, this is combinatorial, and then uh, we also have warped cones, which are somehow a uh, sister object to this kind of constructions, which uses groups, and warped cones are also interesting coarse objects, which use group actions on uh, usually compact spaces. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the three main ways in which we know how to construct expanders, and um, I'd just like to tell you a bit more about this way, so the one that uses groups. Uh, so when our group is residually finite, okay, so when uh, when we have a residually finite group, i.e. we have some sequence of normal subgroups, which um, when intersected all together gives us just the trivial element. So, is the definition I'll use for this talk. Obviously, there are others. Um, so this is a sequence of normal subgroups in my group, such that, uh, well, let's already take these subgroups to be nested, just for our purposes, this would be nicer. And um, each of these is a finite index in G, so. And uh, crucially, the intersection of all, over all these subgroups has to be, has to be triple. Okay, so when we, uh, when we look at such a group, um, a very natural object that suggests itself is to look at the finite quotients with respect to such a sequence and see what kind of geometric properties they have. And so the, the next definition is going to be in this direction. So, so G is always going to be finitely generated. And uh, residually finite. Now the, the box space of G with respect to such a sequence as above is simply the disjoint union of all these finite quotients, um, where we put a metric, a natural metric on these quotients in the following way. So we want the metric to be the, um, so if we look at the metric restricted to any one of these finite pieces, we want this metric just to be the, the Cayley graph metric from some fixed finite generating set of G. Okay, so. Uh, so if we fix some finite generating set S of G, we can induce a nice metric on our quotients uh, using this generating set. Okay, and then, um, I mean, in theory, I just care about these quotients, but I want to study them, which kind of um, geometric properties do they have uniformly. So I'm just gonna put them into one space. This is, this is the point of this construction, so that I don't have to um, waste ink and paper and say things like, uh, you know, the quotients have such and such a property in a uniform way or with uniform constants, okay? So I just put them all in one space, just to be able to talk about them in a slightly easier way, so. Uh, so then I want to just say that the distances between uh, different quotients, I just want this to be big. I just want to take this, say, to be the bigger than the sum of the diameters of these quotients. 
Okay, just because I want them all to be in one space, but I don't want the geometric properties of each of them to interfere with the properties of the other ones. Okay, so this just puts all my quotients down in a line, um, spaces them out, allows me to study them uniformly. Okay, and the subject it has very nice properties, much as Cayley graphs do, which I think I'm going to assume that you're, you've seen Cayley graphs before. Okay, so. Um, if you uh, look at these objects, you can actually recover any finite piece of your Cayley graph that you want if you're willing to go far enough along in your sequence. Okay, so um, because our sequence of subgroups has trivial intersection, we can find a big enough quotient if, we're, if we go far enough along in our sequence such that any finite ball in our Cayley graph, we can see it uh, mirrored exactly isometrically with the same labels and everything in our finite quotient. Okay, so we recover the same information as a Cayley graph in some sense. Um, it's also stable under the change of the generating set, just as in the, in the Cayley graph case. So um, I'll just maybe write this down. So if we look at, uh, I didn't give you the notation. So this is the box space of, of G with respect to a particular sequence. If I uh, look at, the metric induced by some generating set S, then I get coarsely equivalent spaces if I don't change my subgroups, but I just change the generating set which I took. Okay, I take some S prime, then I get coarsely equivalent objects. Okay, so for us, these are really the same objects. Um, one important thing to realize is if I change the sequence of subgroups, then I can get wildly different, uh, different properties for my box space. Okay, so in particular, Okay, we saw what kind of properties we care about. We care about maybe the fact that these things are well connected, these things are expanders. And for example, for the free group, which obviously has a lot of finite quotients, we can find different sequences which both have trivial intersection, one of which um, is an expander, and the other one actually even embeds into Hilbert space coarsely. So you can get a lot of different, uh, you can get a whole zoo of, of spaces with different properties by varying the, the sequence of subgroups. Um, okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about box spaces. Uh, and just as with this uh, construction, so we use some group theoretic property to construct expanders, which are groups, um, groups with property T. We can also do uh, various other things. Uh, we can deduce many interesting connections between geometric properties of box spaces and um, algebraic or analytic <coughs> properties of the group. So, uh, geometric. properties of box spaces are connected to properties of G. Okay, and one can exploit this connection in order to create examples of spaces with interesting properties. So for example, I think Romain uh, Tessera will talk about um, <clears throat> some examples of box spaces which uh, do not contain expanders but do not coarsely embed the Hilbert space, so showing that containing an expander coarsely isn't the only obstruction to embedding into Hilbert space. Um, okay, and so back to expanders now. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, rigidity of these various coarse objects that we've constructed. So, um, and just as some motivation, I'd like to mention the paper by uh, Mendel and Naur. So um, Mendel and Naur um, proved that one can use this combinatorial construction, so zigzag product, to construct uh, super expanders. Um, and in the process, well, I think they, they had the idea to maybe try to tackle this open question of whether all expanders are super expanders uh, by maybe just showing that um, these expanders, which we know to be super expanders, maybe coarsely embed into any other kind of expander. Okay, that would solve it, right? Because obviously, uh, then any expander could not be embedded into a uniformly convex Banach space. So, uh, but they, they showed this actually wasn't the case by showing that um, they gave actually just two examples of um, expanders which could not be embedded into one another, which were not coarsely equivalent. So. Um, I think one of them had large girth, so girth is the length of the smallest loop in your graph, and one of the examples had 
uh, goes tending to infinity, and the other example did not. Okay, so this was some uh, kind of the first example in in this direction, and uh, also I think Ostrovsky asked this question more explicitly. Um, I think in in his book. Uh, and the question is, how many expanders are there up to course equivalence? Okay, so maybe all of these constructions actually give us pretty much the same objects, okay? And that wouldn't be um, ideal in some sense. We want this world to be very varied since these are very nice, useful objects. Um, okay, and so as I said, Mandela and Noah gave the first example where they distinguished uh, expanders coarsely, and then um, there was a result by David Hume who proved that um, in the world of large girth um, expanders, so expanders where the length of the smallest loop is tending to infinity along the sequence, um, there is actually a continuum of uh, coarsely different expanders with large curves. Okay, and his method used um, combinatorial, a combinatorial invariant uh, first introduced by Benjamini, Schramm, and Tima. Um, so this was uh, the first time we proved that there are actually infinitely many expanders. Um, okay, and so, oh, if I talk to the, if I talk down, then it's louder, isn't it? Okay, um, so what we'd like to do now is we'd like to use the fact that a lot of expanders come from box spaces in order to prove that there are many of them, okay, by giving some kind of rigidity uh, properties of expanders as box spaces. So, so the question now becomes, Given that two box spaces, okay, so we take two residually finite groups, G and H, we take two sequences of subgroups with trivial intersections in both of them, normal subgroups, a finite index, and then we suppose that these, uh, we know these box spaces to be coarsely equivalent. And what can we deduce about the groups from this? So. What can we say about G and H? Okay, um, and um, we proved with uh, Alain Vallette that uh, one can deduce uh, in quite a natural way that. Uh, G and H, given that they're course, uh, the box spaces are coarsely equivalent, G and H are quasi-isometric, okay? So remember, quasi-isometries were just like coarse equivalences, except our control functions were linear, okay? So, well, let's call this, uh, let's call this star, okay? So, um, okay, so star implies G and H are quasi-asymmetric, okay, which is really the, so the Cayley graphs are quasi-asymmetric, which is really kind of the, the correct notion of two groups being geometrically the same in the world of uh, groups. Okay, and so this actually leads straight away to lots of uh, conclusions about various expanders that we know how to construct from groups. So in particular, uh, we straight away get that we have actually infinitely many expanders coming from um, groups with property T. So. Okay, so groups such as uh, S L and Z for varying n. Uh, We know these groups uh, are not quasi-asymmetric for n not equal to m. <coughs> this is a result of Eskin. 
And so if we take box spaces uh, for different n, then we know that they won't be coarsely equivalent, okay, by our results with LM. So, um, in fact, one can get a continuum, just as in the case of David Hume, if you're also will willing to vary the, the subgroups for each group, okay. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's already um, uh, a lot of expanders just from this kind of uh, very natural result. And uh, I'd just like to mention also um, some other results in this direction. So then uh, there's a nice result of Kajal Das, who also proved that this condition star, so if the box space is, of course, equivalent, then um, the groups are uniformly measure equivalent. So he gave a measure theoretic conclusion and some interesting applications as well. Um, and another result in this direction is by Delat and uh, Vigoro, who used um, similar methods to, so rigidity methods to um, coarsely distinguish super expanders which are coming from warped cones, which are these uh, other course geometric constructions which use group actions. Okay, so. Okay. Um, great. So what else can we say about uh, rigidity of box spaces? So for the moment, we just have a, a geometric conclusion for the groups. And well, if, you, if you've seen some results in geometric group theory, we like linking uh, algebraic or uh, more structural properties of our groups to some geometric aspect uh, of the Cayley graph. So we'd like to have some results in this kind of direction. Um, so that motivates the, the next part of the talk. So, um, so now the question becomes, can we get some algebraic rigidity for our box spaces? Okay, um, this is, so this part of the talk is joint work with uh, Thibaut de Labie. And, um, okay, so let me just give you a bit of an aside for the moment about uh, fundamental groups, okay? So remember, fundamental groups, pi one, um, consider loops on a, on a space, okay? So if we take, for example, some, some torus or something like this, okay, we can consider uh, loops which are based at some given point, okay, um, up to uh, homotopy. And um, in a torus, for example, we essentially have two different loops and they commute, so we know that the fundamental group of the torus is um, Z squared, okay? And um, more specifically for graphs, okay, if I take pi one of any graph, okay, then I always get a free group. Okay, so for example, if I have this kind of graph or, well, any, any kind of graph, so if you just look at the homotopy classes of loops in a graph, you will always get something free. Um, if you also consider that your graph is labeled, okay, so if, for example, I have a um, quotient of a free group, so I have some labels coming from the free group on my, on my graph, okay, so I have something like this, this is just a free group on n generators and I quotient out by some normal subgroup, then if I take the fundamental group of this, well, if you think about it, so this is a, you can consider this as a Cayley graph, and if you look at loops in this graph, you're always going to read off elements of n, okay? Because fn doesn't have any relations, the fn doesn't have any loops, the, its Cayley graph is a tree, and if you look at the fundamental group of this guy, well, you're going to exactly read off all the elements of n, and so you're going to recover, you're going to recover n the subgroup that you've quotiented by, okay? So, um, so this is very nice, um, 
But unfortunately, if you look at a general, if you look at a general group which isn't free, and you try to do the same thing, okay, this in general will of course not be isomorphic to n because as I said, for a graph, the fundamental group is always free, okay? So we can see that the fundamental group, um, why, why am I talking about the fundamental group? Well, because I'd like to uh, get some kind of algebraic rigidity from my box spaces. So in some sense, I'd like to recover the normal subgroups which I quotiented by, okay? That would be ideal, of course. That would be the, the maximum information that we could get. Okay, and so, okay, I see that Okay, it works for free groups, I can use the fundamental group, but while the fundamental group doesn't behave very well coarsely anyway, under coarse equivalences, so that's, that's not very useful, and also we don't have it for all groups, so that's a shame. Uh, but what we can do is we can try and define a coarse version of the fund fundamental group, so uh, called, called unsurprisingly the coarse fundamental group. Okay, and this was first defined by um, Barcelo. Just gonna check the names. Because since this is being filmed, I don't want there to be evidence of me getting the alphabet wrong. Uh, so Barcelo, Kramer, Laubenbacher, and Weaver. And uh, there's also a nice paper by Barcelo, Capraro, and White. Okay. And um, so we're going to try and define this coarse version uh, of the fundamental group now to try and detect the subgroups which we use in the box space construction. Okay, in order to hopefully um, get even more rigidity. Okay, so what's the setting? Our setting will be uh, that of a finite Cayley graph. Okay, so we have some finite Cayley graph x. Um, there's a natural base point which we can take, but it, well, it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to take the base point to be the identity, and then um, okay. Well, now we need to define what paths are, right? So paths are going to be. Um, are going to be, uh, as opposed to the world of uh, homotopy classes of loops, okay, or, or paths, uh, we're now going to look at discrete versions of uh, paths. So we're just going to look at maps from the integers up to sort of the length of the path, okay, into our space X, uh, which are one Lipschitz. Okay, this is a very natural notion of what a discrete path might be. Okay, so if I if I have some graph, then well, something like this. You know, I'd like that to be a path, ideally. Okay, and, and it is under this definition. Okay, uh, of course, being one Lipschitz, we also allow uh, our path to stay still at certain points. Okay, and that's just a technicality, but um, essentially, paths are these kind of objects. Okay, uh, now I want to define um, a coarse version, a discrete version of homotopies so that I can consider my paths up to homotopies. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm going to tell you what it means for two paths to be R close. Okay, so I fix some, fix some parameter R, okay, and I'm going to consider the fundamental group on this scale. Okay, so this is a, a kind of a scale on which I will consider my fundamental group. <laughs> Um, okay, and I'm going to say that two paths P and Q are, are close, are close if uh, the following holds. So um, either the lengths are the same, and then for all i, I have that uh, the distance in my graph x between the point pi and qi is bounded by r, okay, so they're, as they're going along, they're staying r close to each other. Uh, or, if the distances uh, are not the same, 
So if the lengths of the paths are not the same, then uh, I just need to account for the fact that one path sort of needs to wait for um, the other path at the end, okay? So that's is going to look a bit technical, but um, bear with me. So um, for all uh, i less than or equal to the minimum over these lengths, now we have that the paths are just the same, okay? Uh, and for all i uh, greater than this minimum, one path just waits for the other one. Okay, and which condition we pick here just depends on which path is longer. Um, so, so you, I mean, don't, you don't have your R, and uh, you don't have the distance R when the lengths are different. Or? Yeah, because uh, what we're going to do is, um, I mean, we just have these two conditions so that we can now define our homotopies because we can define them as compositions of these uh, R close relations. So. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you should just think about this, okay? So paths go along and they stay close together, okay? Or they have different lengths and then they're exactly the same, but one waits for the other one at the end, okay? Um, okay, so now our homotopies, let's find them over here. So now we say that P and Q are, are homotopic uh, if there exists some, some sequence, okay? Starting with P and then finishing in uh, Q. Okay, the sequence can have any length. We don't care what length it has, it doesn't depend on R or anything. Um, just as long as uh, PI and PI plus 1 are, are close at each point. Okay? So, um, what this allows you to do essentially, if you think about it, if you have some loops of length less than 2R, you can jump over them using this homotopy, okay? So if you have something like, like this, okay, and this length of a loop in my graph has length uh, less than 2R, okay? So if my path, if my loop does something like this, then I can just, first of all, get rid of this loop using this um, homotopy, and then I can get rid of this path as well, okay? So that's just, that's just trivial, okay? So. Uh, so, yeah, so we can jump over our homotopies allow us to jump over holes of size less than or equal to R, okay? Okay, so what's the, what's the main idea behind this? I mean, why do we want to define this uh, object? So, yeah, obviously the, the fundamental group is defined as, uh, as follows. So the fundamental group at, of x based at 1 is simply all the loops, uh, well, let's say r loops, based at 1 up to uh, our homotopy. Okay. In reality, we can actually take one loops because uh, given any R loop, we can find a one loop, which is our homotopic to it. But um, okay, let's just stick to this. Okay, and what's the, what's the idea? Why do we want to do this? Well, as I said, we want this to be a nice coarse object. And um, indeed, this does behave pretty well coarsely in a way I'll say in a second. But the main idea is, uh, so if I have my, my Cayley graph of uh, G mod N, okay, G not being a free group, okay, so I mean, I have some loops, okay, I have some loops coming from, from G and I have some loops coming from N, okay, and in my situation of a box space, okay, I have this sequence of subgroups which I can make uh, smaller and smaller, so I can, if G only has uh, a set number of, of loops, so if G is finally presented, okay, this is the, the situation that we're looking at, 
if G is finally presented, okay, we only have a finite number of loops which generate all of the relations of G. Okay? So um, if I only have a finite number of loops generating all the relations of G, I can take an I which is big enough, which makes the loop, loops of N of, of an I far enough away from the small loops of G. Okay, so here I have the loops of G, okay, and I want to ignore those in my fundamental group, okay, and I have these loops of Ni which are much bigger. So what does my fundamental group do? My coarse fundamental group, it actually just, I mean, it's 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 essentially like gluing in some simplices which uh, allow us to kill all the generators, uh, kill all the relations coming from G, which were already there in G to begin with, and then just leave the relators of Ni, uh, the, the generators of Ni, sorry, which come up as loops, these bigger loops in my Cayley graph, okay, and then that way I can hopefully detect Ni, okay? So the idea is to take some scale R which lies somewhere between the length of the longest relator of G, okay, so that I kill all the things coming from G, and then um, leaves me uh, all of the generators of an I, all these loops coming from the fact that I've quotiented by an I um, intact. Okay, so and that should hopefully give me an I, and indeed it does. Um, <coughs> so the, the theorem is as follows. This is by Delaby and myself. Uh, the theorem is as follows, so if I take a finally presented group with S generators and R relations, um, and I take uh, some R which is in between, um, in between, um, I'm gonna write it like this, so I want R to be in between the infimum over all the lengths of elements in uh, n, which are not the identity, okay? I obviously don't want to count the identity, so I want my r to be small enough to not kill anything from n, and I want r to be big enough so that it does kill all the generators of g. So I want, um, I want my r to be bigger than the maximum over all the lengths of the relators in r, okay? Um, and if I take such an R, then, uh, I mean, I've written here sort of a lot bigger than, a lot smaller than, but, I mean, there's some constants associated, but it's not very important. And uh, then this coarse fundamental group of uh, my Cayley graph of G mod N will uh, be isomorphic to N. Okay, so I do detect the subgroup by which I've quotiented. And this is uh, helpful because, well now I can actually detect the subgroups I've used to create my box space. So, uh, corollary is as follows, uh, well, the condition star. So if my box space is of course the equivalent, then, uh, so if my groups are finally presented, and finally generated and residually finite, obviously, uh, then we essentially have that the subgroups I've used to create these two, these two box spaces, okay, I, maybe I had the subgroups Ni and G and Mi and H, um, these subgroups are actually isomorphic, okay, so I completely algebraically detect uh, the subgroups which I used to uh, construct my space. I've written quotation marks just because there might be some small permutation of, of the subgroups I've used. Um, but essentially we get this, and of course this in particular means that uh, G and H are simply uh, commensurable. Okay, so this is a very strong uh, algebraic rigidity result for these groups. And um, I just want to say that in this proof we actually use the result uh, with Alain, so um, we use the geometric rigidity to deduce certain things about maps between these box spaces, and then we actually use, uh, so uses uh, this result, and uh, it also uses hopficity of these groups, hopficity, um, 
which is a kind of happy coincidence that residually finite groups are Hopfian to deduce um, this isomorphism. And uh, in the last remaining zero minutes, I'll just uh, give you some applications and uh, comments. Um, so one thing, uh, I think I'll just tell you orally. Um, so one, one thing that's quite um, surprising about this result is that it really, uh, it can give you examples which are very different from the case of uh, finely generated groups and their Cayley graphs, okay? So we're used to um, the Cayley graphs of finely generated groups. If uh, the subgroups are commensurable, we're used to the Cayley graphs being the same, right? They're quasi-symmetric. But uh, in this situation, what we can do is we can actually find box spaces which only differ, um, so the index, well, maybe I, I will write it down. <laughs> um, so we can actually find, um, so corollary, there exists a group G and sequences of subgroups in G as follows. Uh, so we have that um, the subgroups are nested in this way and also that the index is bounded by some uniform constant, let's say C. Um, okay, so the subgroups that we're using to construct this box space are very, very close. Okay, so you'd expect the box space is given this uniform condition across all of the subgroups to be uh, coarsely equivalent, but actually you can find such an example such that they're not. Okay, so as I said, this, this uh, is a, a very surprising thing. So this really shows that the, the box spaces, so the quotients in the box spaces can be a proportional sizes with the proportionality being uniform, but they can have completely different, uh, well, they can be geometrically different. So this is kind of strange. And then um, just uh, one can also, of course, use this result to um, differentiate between various course objects. So for example, one can show that there are infinitely many course equivalence classes which contain Ramanujan graphs, so kind of the strongest type of expander. Uh, with respect to the spectral gap. And then uh, just uh, another comment is that um, Vigolo uh, has constructed some interesting examples of expanders which actually have trivial coarse fundamental group, which also come from warped cones. So they're coarsely simply connected, which um, obviously makes them different from any other expanders that have so far been constructed. Yeah. Okay, I'll finish there. Thank you.